Great. Well, welcome to the penultimate lecture in this brown bag series. Uh, thanks to those of you who have stuck it out. For those of you who are uh, just joining, um, I hope you enjoy it. For those of you who have just been bouncing around and checking out bits and pieces of the lectures, I hope you found something that made it worthwhile. Um, in any case, please feel free to uh, reach out to me for context. Speaking of context, we're starting once again with this lovely icon uh, developed by Jonathan Anderson in conjunction with uh, Nico Bryan and myself during our work at Evolve. Um, and we're going to jump right into today's talk, which is Taylorism, Thurblings, and Time in a Bottle. Um, the concept we are going to be talking around today is the idea of measuring improvement versus improving measurement. And that process, while we try to do it deliberately, sometimes is often entirely unconscious for reasons that I hope are entirely predictable to those of you uh, who've been through a few of these lectures already. Um, either way, I'm going to walk you through it a bit now. And uh, of course, all of it will be tied back into the greater um, societal context of current events, like always. Let's get going. So today, um, we're going to start with the ideas that I've already shared, like we always do. And uh, the fact that thinking at three speeds makes us prone to generalization and really emotionally fragile prejudices. Um, and it makes us feel as though we are absolutely certain, not, not feel, it, it, it makes us know that we are absolutely certain that we know better than any experts about any field. And we are more insightful and intuitive and clever than every other person individually or combined. Um, these ridiculous biases and prejudices uh, become stronger when we're under stress, like we all are now. And uh, the way to make them weaker, the way to mitigate these biases, is to um, expose them carefully and slowly to rational thought that has to come from inside the same skull that the biases are coming from. So we can help others get past their biases in the same way that we can help ourselves get past ours but it requires reaching out into the world and trusting what we learn from the world and the people in it as much as we trust what we already feel we know and maybe more. So let's talk about that some more. So once again, a summary of the triune brain, according to my brain's model. Um, our reflexes surprise us almost all of the time because they happen without thought. Uh, the, once we're surprised, then any reactions we have, the, the fast pattern recognition, the emotionally laden stuff that I talked about before coming from the middle part of the brain, the limbic system, all of that is gonna be based then on the fact that we've just been surprised. <laughs> and only after that, then our rational minds approach the new information we've been exposed to. And as I've said several times and will continue to say until I have strong evidence otherwise, um, our rational minds mostly go to work then, not in challenging what we've just heard, not in uh, challenging what we believe about what we've just heard in any kind of rational way. Instead, our rational minds go to work immediately trying to justify what we already believe about what we've just heard. And we create these complex webs of ridiculous false certainty that it, that shelter us from new information inside a, an illusion of competence and control. But our rational minds don't have to do that. Like I said a moment ago, if they are triggered in the right way, they can see through our prejudices and we can see through our prejudices and learn from new things. But it's hard. It's certainly non-intuitive. So again, a, a quick summary in a, a different set of phrases for those who think of it differently. Uh, there's a part of our mind that's always either afraid or overconfident. And that part of our mind, uh, that's that proto-prosimian, um, it's always looking for comfort. It wants comfort in being overconfident or it want com wants comfort from the fear it feels. And it finds that comfort either by being ridiculously certain or ridiculously ignorant. 
And as I have said several times and will continue to say, calm, slow, rational thought enables us to get past that and learn from new outside information, uh, what Piaget called sociogenesis rather than psychogenesis, uh, ideas that come from outside of us, from our society or from the world. Uh, by embracing that information, then we are capable uh, of trusting what others have learned or experienced and using that new information to change the way that we think, to have a better image of ourselves, of them, and of the world around us and our place in it. So calm, slow, rational thought, that is to say letters and numbers and logic, give us the ability to learn new information. And ideally to learn new information that can be used by other people, not just by ourselves. Mm -hmm. Letters and numbers and logic that can be used by other people, not just by ourselves. Well, of course, standards play a big part in this idea. The things that we can all agree on, like counting, right? That's maybe one of the simple unconscious standards we have across languages, across cultures. We all count, right? Something we all agree on or say we do. But the truth is that we use different ways of counting for different situations, totally unconscious of what we're doing that. So why do we do one, why do we count some things one way and some things another way? Well, because these protocols, like I said, that we follow uh, for deciding what to count which way, um, but the, so for the most part, that's completely unconscious. And because of that, we are incapable of questioning them until we stop and think slowly about what we're doing. Um, now I know that's all pretty abstract. So let's use for a moment, some protocols that are used for estimating numbers of people in a given space. Um, now, you and I may not know those protocols in particular, but some people do, and some people use them. Um, and when they use these protocols, they can get very different numbers depending on, well, depending on who's using them and what for. So you can look at an event like, say, an inauguration speech, and you can say that it was either very well or very poorly attended. And it's all dependent on whose estimates you choose to believe. Um, well, I mean, unless something is so visually obvious or a statement is so logically fallacious that you are forced to look at the two and compare them and say, hmm, I see something here contrary to my thoughts. But for the use of these protocols, uh, the methodology being used and the intent of the people using it um, are shaping which protocols they use. Um, and what that boils down to is why are they counting and what are they calling the people that they count? Uh, and this is where standards come into it. I mean, think about the fact that you could be looking at um, ongoing protests right? Sorry about that. You could be looking at ongoing protests right now in the street, and you could be hearing some people looking at the same crowd and saying, these are protesters, and there are this many of them. And other people would be saying, these are rioters, and there are this many of them. And the odds are that if one group is calling them protesters and another group is calling them rioters, they're probably describing the numbers as being different. Maybe because the one group is trying to say, that uh, this is a sign that there should be political change and the other group is trying to say this is a sign that the National Guard should be called in. So again, this is why we um, benefit from having standards. Consider that uh, these kinds of soft numbers I've been talking about only work when differences of opinion are viable. Consider, as opposed to that, a fire marshal who can't use soft numbers. Um, they need to meet established regulatory standards. Um, and they need to do that in a way that's measurably done. They need to uh, meet these regulatory standards in a way that can be proven or disproven in order to keep their jobs and in order to save lives, which is probably why some people hate regulatory standards. Um, to put it simply, you can't be vague with very precise numbers. You can be vague with estimates. And the more roughly you're estimating, the more soft the number is, the more easy it is to convince people that your interpretation of it, though it may run contrary to what seems clear, your interpretation of it may be accurate. 
Um, whereas with precise numbers, it's really hard to be vague. Like you couldn't say that uh, 6,200 is uh, a crowd like I guess nobody's seen before. I'm pretty sure lots of people have seen crowds of 6,200 around there about. The precise number makes it hard to have the strong forceful opinion contrary to fact. Now, that's probably offending all kinds of people in so many different ways. So let's go for a, a less political example and talk about eggs and baked goods. Uh, I think that's something that's less political that it's, uh, more people have experienced. If you haven't experienced uh, purchasing eggs or baked goods, then um, I'm sorry, I guess you don't have a direct experience with the example I'm about to give. Sorry about that. Sincerely sorry. I, I, I'd like to find one that will suit you, but maybe you can give me some feedback later and I can find one that way. And that way it'll suit the next audience who hear this. Um, so eggs and baked goods, uh, we sell those by the dozen, we buy those by the dozen. You all know the phrase cheaper by the dozen, a phrase I mentioned a few times in these talks when uh, discussing a couple of scientists whose work I really admire. And I will be mentioning them and this phrase uh, again in a little while. But uh, cheaper by the dozen describes a way of purchasing things and why you would purchase a dozen instead of less than a dozen. Um, and I think personally that this is because the purchasing of eggs and other uh, and, and baked goods goes back to um, in, in a fairly direct line to time before there was a standardized accepted uh, unit of weight that could be used no matter where you were. Um, and that could be trusted. Um, so, I mean, it's possible we could sell bread by the pound. Uh, we do sell meat by the pound and uh, some fruit by the pound, but instead we continue to sell it uh, by uh, the loaf or by the uh, dozen or half dozen um, uh, buns. Uh, again, I think this is just because of a force of habit that comes from uh, a long time ago before there was dependable stuff. And, and speaking of things that come from a long time ago, that phrase cheaper by the dozen is an interesting phrase that continues to be used now, uh, as are the phrases milestones or uh, one bad apple or a few bad apples. Um, there's a few different versions of that phrase, but in fact, let, let's, let's leave milestones aside until later and talk about that phrase about bad apples for just a moment. Um, one bad apple don't spoil the whole bunch girl, a line from uh, the Osmonds 1970 hit, uh, One Bad Apple. <laughs> or we could go a little further back to see an earlier source of the same uh, notion, uh, which is from uh, Chaucer's The Canterbury Tales and specifically The Cook's Tale. Um, it is better to take the rotten apple out of the bag than to have it rot all of the other apples. And please notice that these two statements are contrary. The old established phrase that's the foundation of this, um, is even older than uh, the uh, 1400 uh, date of uh, the Cook's Tale, uh, because in the Cook's Tale, uh, the character um, explains that this expression is an old expression. So already uh, 600 years ago, 620 years ago, this was an old expression. Um, better to take out the rotten apple than to have it rot all of the other apples, because Contrary to how the phrase is used now, when people are using it quite a bit these days, um, mostly uh, commentators on 24-hour news channels and, um, uh, or police spokesmen, um, when, when folks are using the phrase now, they seem to say what the Osmonds uh, protagonist was saying when he was singing for his uh, girlfriend to forgive him. Uh, one bad apple don't spoil the whole bunch. But that's not how the phrase works. The phrase is actually based on real apples. And what happens if there is a real spoiled apple in a bag or barrel or bushel of real apples? What happens is the rot in one corrupts the others. That's where that expression comes from. So absolutely, if there is a rotten apple, if there are a few rotten apples, you take them out. And I'm not saying that in some cowboy macho way. I'm saying you remove them from the place where they can corrupt others or else the rot will spread. That's what that expression means. And it always makes me scratch my head when I hear people using it as an excuse. Well, there's, it's just a few bad apples. Oh, well, if that's the case, then in order to save all of the other apples, we'd better 
isolate those few bad ones so that they don't make things worse. Funny, huh? That that could somehow be lost. That's because the process of generalizing knowledge, whether it's old sayings or the ideas that underlie them or new experiences, the process of generalizing knowledge is a process of simplifying knowledge. And simplifying knowledge means that you take a whole bunch of separate data points and you look for an average of them roughly, something like an average. You're not being mathematically precise because you're using the part of your brain that doesn't do math. You're just looking for general impressions. And it, it might be something that you could describe as the mean or the median or the mode or the modal. It, it, it might be. The point is you want a simple way to process complex information. One of the simple ways we do that is through habit. If we have habits of how to do things, then we don't have to rationally think about them. We can just get to work. And uh, our habits can be individual or group or cross-generational. And I won't go into that too much here now. Um, individual habits, we all know them. Living in isolation to one degree or another, we are all forced to live with our habits and to confront them every day for the last few months. I won't go into details about which ones I may be confronting or you may be confronting. But I will say that there's a difference with group habits. Group habits are like the things that you would do when you're with a group of friends, as opposed to the things you would do regularly when you're with a group of colleagues or with family or with strangers. A simple example of that would be the way that you and your friends all might cheer whenever somebody uh, turns on your favorite song or a song you all like um, in a public place. You wouldn't cheer like that if you were alone. You especially wouldn't cheer like that if you weren't alone, but none of your friends were there. If you were surrounded by strangers, it would be a very strange thing indeed to cheer. To the, for the song. A cross-generational habit is a little more complex. That's the things that we have carried on doing because it's always been done that way. Um, an example of that is the way that we've been tying either tree bark or animal skin around our feet with laces made of animal skin um, since the last ice age at least. A strange thing to do. Anyway, let's come back to habits later. Let's come back to all of that later and let's take another walk. You know, it's a predilection of mine that we uh, go for these walks uh, every time I speak with you about these things. And uh, the last walk we took, the last one was pretty hard. <laughs> Honestly, I almost didn't get through it in a couple of places. And I hope that wasn't too obvious to folks who were watching it. Um, it, it was a hard walk, but it was important because examining the things that are difficult to examine carefully meticulously examining them despite the difficulty is a way to avoid pointless opinionated quarreling about simple measurable facts. Measurable facts like what happened in the Greenwood neighborhood in Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1921 or uh, in and around the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama in 1963. These are facts. And there are thousands of other facts that support the idea that being black in America is unjustly dangerous. There's more than enough facts about this. We don't need more data to go forward with this. What we um, need is we need to accept the data we have, even though it's contrary to what we think reflexively. And um, for a lot of us, it just is. But that doesn't matter. We don't need more data. We don't need more evidence. We don't need to get into endless arguments about the quality of the evidence. We just have to accept the fact that the data is there. And despite the denials that some people are going to put forward, saying, no, that's just false, or the rationalizations of others, but it's more complex than that, or there's other issues that we have to con consider and all kinds of other straw men. Despite all of that, we need to change our mental model. according to the new data. That's, that's learning. To learn, we have to admit we were wrong. I've said it before and I'll say it again, but it's hard to do. It's actually frightening to try to face your own ignorance because if you're ignorant, you're probably ignorant about how ignorant you are. That's just frightening. And it's embarrassing when you're around people or want to be around people who you think aren't as ignorant as you are. But for those same reasons, it's really empowering to be part of a team. If you can 
find those whose opinions you can trust, not because you're going to blindly accept them, but because you're going to challenge them and they're going to challenge yours. And you're going to work together to push each other to a better understanding of the truth, then the team that you can form is fantastic. All that it takes to have that kind of fantastic team is to value the experiences that other people have had as equal to or superior to your own experiences. Not blindly, but value the potential. So for today's walk, the penultimate walk in this series, as I mentioned, I'd like to uh, ask you to walk with me for a mile in someone else's moccasins. Now, yeah, I uh, made a bit of a meal of that quote uh, last time I was here, and uh, for good reason. That's a phrase that I grew up hearing from well-meaning people who really intended to say good things by saying it. And I've heard it again from people who felt that their culture was being appropriated. Um, Let's take a look at the woman uh, responsible for the phrase, Mary Torrens Lathrop. She, uh, at the age of 14, was publishing writing in newspapers. She um, became a school teacher. She married a cavalry doctor um, and became eventually a licensed preacher in her Episcopal Methodist church. Um, as she became more famous for her lectures, her public speaking, and her activism, uh, for temperance, which is to say against alcohol, and for women's suffrage, which is to say for the equal rights of women, especially regarding the vote. Um, she also uh, spent money and effort um, on complex things like founding a reform school, because she believed that just because you had been in a bad situation didn't mean that you were a bad person, that you could reform your life. This is more than a hundred years ago. So please understand that the term and the idea maybe have changed a bit since then. Um, she also spent her time and energy uh, actually sewing clothing uh, for, uh, for women who couldn't afford clothing. Um, she was an interesting person. She was also a poet and the single poem she's most known for now, though she was considered quite the writer uh, during her latter years, um, goes like this. Pray don't find fault with the man that limps or stumbles along the road unless you have worn the moccasins he wears or stumbled beneath the same load. Not bad. Um, the poem is called Judge Softly, though most people call it uh, Walk a Mile in His Moccasins. Um, Judge Softly, it was written in, in the year of her death, uh, 1895. She was a young woman when she died. Um, and this is just the first verse. There, there will be more of this poem later. The question I want to ask you is this, this well-meaning woman who was such an activist, was she an ally to the people she was writing about? In, in the poem, she specifies people living in ghettos and people living on reservations. Was she an ally to them? Was she a cultural appropriator? Was she trying to be a white savior? To address this issue, I want to go back to a question I asked a couple of weeks ago. What defines a shape, like a circle or a square? What makes a shape, either one or the other? Part of the answer is standards. So let's look at her and the question about what she was, which shape she was. She was a radical activist. There, there is no doubt of that. But what is she now? Please give that some thought as we try to walk a mile in her moccasins. Now, of course, being a scientist, I can't agree to walk a mile until I've decided what a mile actually is. We have to have some common agreement on that. So what is a mile? Well, it comes from the Middle English, mile, or from the Old English, meal, um, which, uh, both of which come from the Latin mille passus, which I guess may be common knowledge. I'm not sure. Uh, mille passus means a thousand strides or a thousand paces. Um, a thousand paces, I guess, is pretty, uh, pretty close to the Latin phrase mille passus. And um, that's, that's where the word mile comes from. It's an abbreviation of that. And despite that common ancestry, it goes back all the way to Rome. Um, 
there's a lot of def different definitions of, of mild all the same. So in Rome, in the ancient days, when Augustus was Caesar and his friend Agrippa was in charge of a lot of the standards in the Roman Empire, uh, Agrippa decided that a pace, uh, which had always been rough, right, uh, depending on the weather, the time of day, how hard the men have been working, they can walk a different number of paces. <laughs> so talking, and the paces are different lengths. So talking about numbers of paces was hard. Agrippa decided that uh, a single pace would be standardized as five of his foot lengths. So five feet, if the foot was Agrippa's, uh, became a mile, uh, became a pace, and then a thousand of those became a mile. In England, uh, Henry I uh, decided that it was a thousand of his arms. Um, the length of his arm, head turned the other way, finger outstretched. The length of that was... Uh, 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 one yard and then a thousand yards uh, was a mile. In Austria, uh, a little while after that, they standardized the mile as about uh, seven and a half kilometers, modern kilometers, uh, which is quite different. And in the Netherlands, at around the same time as that, they called it uh, Urgans, which means um, uh, an hour's walk. <laughs> so it was actually measured in time. Uh, the uh, Persians, of course, being horrible, primitive barbarians, uh, incapable of simple standards of measurement. Yes, that's sarcastic. Uh, they decided that a mile was one arc minute of latitude along a, a north-south or south-north uh, meridian. Yeah, so there were some ancient uh, people who weren't just measuring with their hands or their arms or their feet and deciding from standard numbers of that. Um, one arc minute of latitude, slightly different way of measuring a mile. Pretty impressive, I think. Um, but that's not the only thing that was different in different places when we look back on world history of standardization. Um, and to talk about uh, that a little bit differently, I, I wanna talk about the difference between written English and written Spanish. Um, and specifically, uh, we can look at it in terms of the pronunciation. Uh, but if we go back to around the time that the Persians were saying that you should actually measure an arc minute <laughs> along the meridian, um, if we go back and look at that, uh, let's go back a little further than that, actually, and compare two really early pieces of written work, um, the Cantar de Miocid from Spain um, and Chaucer's uh, Treatise on the Astrolabe uh, from England, uh, the, the first um, scientific writing in English that I'm aware of, a uh, treatise on the astrolabe. Astrolabe was a tool. Um, you, you can see them if you, if you want to look them up and see how they worked. And if you do look up astrolabes, um, you can probably manage to look up the treatise as well. But good luck understanding. Chaucer's treatise on the, on the astrolabe, uh, like his Canterbury Tales, which I referred to earlier, um, is Decameron. Uh, the, the writing is completely unintelligible to us now. Old English is nothing like modern English. Whereas um, Cantar de Miocid in Old Spanish can be read by someone who can read Spanish now. Um, moving from the time of Chaucer to the time of Shakespeare, you're just a couple hundred years forward, you could consider uh, Shakespeare's Sonnet 18. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? You could consider Sonnet 18. And Sonnet 18 is weird and poetic and uses some words we don't know, but you can read it and understand it as a modern English speaker. There might be a word here or there you don't know, but you will understand the written word. Whereas with Chaucer, you simply will not. Um, and then imagine going from Shakespeare a few hundred years ago up to 2000 and Oh, that's terrible, 2004 or 2008? I think it was 2004, but I could be wrong. Um, Octavia Butler's brilliant science fiction story, The Parable of the Sower. I recommend you read everything she's ever written. Be careful with this one. <laughs> this is set in 2025, and uh, it's a post-apocalyptic time of of, or pre-apocalyptic time of climate change, drastic climate change. And our character, a young woman in America, is facing a world of 
gated communities for the working poor and middle class, the few of them who remain. Most of the wealth has gone to the extreme upper class, and the vast majority of the world are homeless and jobless and are a constant threat to the safety of everyone who owns anything. And there is a president in power who was elected with the promise of making America great again. So be careful with that story. Uh, but if you, if you read her beautiful writing with a few invented words for the purposes of the fantasy and science fiction in the story, um, contemporary beautiful English and some prediction about the, the near future of English. If you compare that to Shakespeare or to Chaucer, you see a huge transformation in the language, a huge change in the standard of what is English, completely different to the change in standards between Old Spanish and Modern Spanish. And that's really complex. I'm going to fly through this now because I got kind of lost there taking my time. Um, so the Normans from the north of France, the sort of uh, bump country bumpkins of France, uh, came in and conquered England uh, from the Saxons who were from the Narrows of Denmark. They had come in a few hundred years earlier and conquered the British Isles from the Celts. Uh, they came from these Narrows, uh, or as they said in Old Danish, Angles, which is where the word England or England comes from, uh, and the, the name of the language. Um, there was this exchange of power uh, at the same time, or roughly the same time, historically speaking, there was the plague. And Europe had to be repopulated. And a strange thing happened. You remember how I said um, that we, uh, we try to belong to groups. We try to show that we belong to groups so that we can have this shared resource of uh, reassurance and, uh, and uh, that, that shared um, sharing of opinions that allows us to self-calibrate. Um, I mentioned that a little while ago. Uh, when Europe was repopulating, a strange thing happened. The, um, the cities repopulated about a hundred years before the towns did. A lot of towns just stayed empty. People moved to the cities for the greater opportunities, even though the cities were the source of the plague, um, or, or the worst um, uh, death rate for the plague. And so the cities became repopulated first, and they became repopulated with folks from the country who had different dialects. And the result was that these different dialects came together in cities in ways that they hadn't before and changed um, the effect on the spoken word region by region. The cities became more regionally based rather than upper class based in their language. Um, and that included a lot of French loan words and French sounds that came into English um, uh, uh, from the Normans. Uh, these words that had been in power, well, it's, it's the idea that um, if uh, I say to, to, to spit, I'm being vulgar. Uh, but if I say to expectorate, then I'm being so posh that nobody understands what I'm talking about, right? Or to chew, to masticate. Um, these Latin rooted words that came with the, the French into England were upper class words. And the, uh, the, the Danish or Germanic rooted words that had been there for a hundred, few hundred years uh, more had become lower class words and nobody would say them in proper society. So this funny thing happened. Um, and then there was this overcorrection the other way after the Hundred Years War. Um, and uh, the overcorrection saw people trying deliberately to not use the Latin pronunciations, uh, others trying deliberately to use uh, Latin pronunciations. A weird vowel shift happened, the introduction of really weird complex diphthongs two vowels and one syllable sort of sounds. Um, it, I'd love to go into more detail about this, but uh, you can read about it if you look up the great vowel shift um, uh, to see how the English language changed. And please do look it up, but be careful when you're doing that. That's vowel with a V. Um, don't, don't make that mistake. And it's uh, certainly shift with an F in the word. Anyway, the point I want to touch on here is that the, during this time, the, the printing press was established. And while the vowels were changing, while we were adding diphthongs and uh, changing the pronunciation of words and the spelling of words to suit this change in regional and international language uh, uh, effects, um, suddenly printing became standard. And that meant that something written in one place could be seen in another place easily. And that meant that English got trapped with a bunch of mixed spellings from different effects. Um, 
And it wasn't just spellings, it was also the things they were writing about. So units of measurement that had been regional, right? Uh, th this is the yard, I put out my finger, I turn my head the other way, this is a yard where I live. And a thousand of those is a mile where I live because I'm the boss. My brother-in-law is, is the boss over in that valley and he's a foot and a half taller than I am. So his miles are much longer than mine. So that suits me because it makes his valley smaller in miles than mine. Um, anyway, th these units of measurement that we were using uh, and all of the words we uh, used to describe them, that all changed when printing became widespread because everything could be standardized. And having things standardized meant that the people and parts that were essential to that, my arm defines how long a yard is and thus how long a mile is. Um, Agrippa's foot decides how long a foot is and thus how long a yard is and thus how long a mile is. Oh, and for fans of the Princess Bride, this is Agrippa the politician, not Agrippa the swords master. Um, wrong reference, hope, hope you weren't confused. Um, but as this writing became standardized and the units could become standardized and this meant that you could save a lot of time trying to translate things uh, from one region's values to another. Over a couple hundred years, the standardization of tasks led to scientific management. And scientific management was the idea that production could be measurably improved simply by carefully and deliberately thinking things out and planning them. All the chairs have the same legs in all four positions. We can have some people just making chair legs and others assembling them which doesn't sound like a big deal because of course chairs are made like that, but they didn't used to be. It used to be that if someone was, was making you a chair, they would make the seat and they would make the legs and they would make them to suit what was actually there so that all the legs managed to reach the floor at about the same place. Standardization changed everything. And I've talked to you before uh, about the great film, uh, Modern Times, the last film in which Charlie Chaplin appeared at his, as his little tramp character. And if you still haven't seen it, please do. Um, not just because it's one of the truly great artifacts of American culture, uh, but also because it captures an interesting time when scientific management was coming into the fore. And as promised, I'm gonna to talk to you just briefly about a few of these scientific management heroes. So Frederick Taylor was the guy who introduced the concept of scientific management, the idea of careful and meticulous planning and thought, deciding how things should be done, studying the motion, studying the number of movements it takes people to get things done. Uh, and unless you believe that it was actually Henri Fayol who uh, did this, uh, towards the end of his uh, career, he published his 14 principles, but he had been doing something quite similar to Taylor's scientific management for decades. Um, then you've probably heard of Gantt charts. Uh, even if you're not sure what they are, you've probably used them or seen them. And certainly uh, if you work in modern society, you've probably uh, heard of the idea of task specific bonuses. So that all comes from uh, Henry Gantt uh, from around the same time that Henry Ford was perfecting the idea of assembly lines where all of these prefabricated universally consistent parts could be assembled by people who didn't have to know anything about what happened earlier or later in the process. They could just become specialists in one particular job. And that is entirely the opening part of uh, Charlie Chaplin's great film. And I so encourage you to see it. It's actually hard for me not to laugh out loud now while I'm thinking of that scene. Um, but also um, what was going on at the time and what is only slightly reflected in the film uh, is the work of people like Elton Mayo or Mary Parker uh, Elton Mayo did the Hawthorne experiments, and please look them up. If you're interested in workplace management, it's a great bit of information. He was the one who showed that rather than offering people bonuses, offering them some authority, some autonomy, some influence over what they were doing led to better performance. And uh, Mary Parker uh, was a social worker uh, rather than an engineer, uh, like most of these people. Um, or a psychologist, like I believe Elton Mayo was, um, talked about the actual 
the effect of collaboration and power sharing on uh, the motivation and productivity of workers. And it changed everything, though it took a long time to be executed. And then we come to the Gilberths, Lillian and Frank, and I've talked about them before and I will talk about them again, but I think this is the last time I'll be mentioning them in this lecture series. Um, they coined the term Philbrig for every, uh, every unit of thought or movement um, involved in a task, improving upon Taylorism's pure measurement of tasks. Um, their two oldest children also wrote the book Cheaper by the Dozen, which, as I've said before, is a great book. You should really read it for an insight into these days, uh, those days in particular of early industrialization, those days of introducing the humanity or the human side to industrialized society, and just a fantastic account of a very unique and eccentric family. Um, they made a movie during the lifetime of the children called Cheaper by the Dozen. It's great. I think it's from 1940 or 39. Um, and then a sequel uh, based on the, the sequel written by the same uh, two children, now adults, uh, called Bells on Their Toes. If you can find a copy of Bells on Their Toes, please let me know. I'd like to find a copy. <laughs> and they have nothing to do with the later movies that were made uh, in, in the 80s or 90s or 2000s or whenever those horrible Disney sequels were made. Um, but the point is, during this age, standardization became the standard, and the unique was replaced with the norm. Time was saved and time was money, so that was great for everybody. And there was even a standardization of acceptable deviation. So you create classes of spe specialists in different jobs, the people on the assembly lines, and you rate their speed and just fire the slow ones. The standardization of acceptable deviation went even further than that, too, because when people feel like they're competing, when they are and when they're really not, then they have a further urge to define themselves by the subgroup that they feel they can associate with, as I mentioned before. And while it used to be that our regional dialects was one of the many, many unconscious ways that we self-calibrated and signaled to others that we were all part of the same gang, um, that disappeared then. People tried to lose their, their regional dialects and fit in with the place they were working. And now instead, it's the dialect of the sport or the music that we listen to uh, or watch, the uh, catchphrases and buzzwords of our work. Oh, boy, I could do hours and hours on the catchphrases and buzzwords of our profession. But fortunately, I don't have to. There's a great book out called Uncanny Valley. Um, and I, I'm sorry, I don't remember the name of the author, but she's brilliant. And I encourage you to read the book. I'll, I'll put her name in the book's full name uh, in the notes. Um, all of these things then become how we identify ourselves and how we choose which group to compete with and which group to belong to. And all of them are commodified, as is the choice we make of the clothing we wear, the hairstyle we wear, the neighborhoods uh, we're in how we move through them, and of course, the coffee we bring with us when we do that, and even whether or not we wear masks in public, which shouldn't be commodified, shouldn't be part of a group association. It should just be simple logic at this time. It, it used to be more subtle than a secret fraternity handshake where you could see somebody was shaking hands a little longer and it meant something or a hobo glyph painted on a wall or a, a pile of rocks even sometimes to say which houses will give handouts and which ones have angry dogs. Uh, or even a largely forgotten triangle uh, used prominently in the tweet of a major political party in America last week as though that were somehow acceptable. It used to be that we'd show a bit of who we are and what we believe and some of the things we've decided to be proud of, things about our past and where we come from, or more likely things about who we are now, and who we choose to be now. And uh, these are the acceptable bread and circuses, the things that we can care about, the important stuff that people get riled up about that really isn't important at all, except in that it gives us the chance to be part of a defined group and show an oversimplification, an overgeneralization of who we really are and who we want to associate with and who we want to exclude. And this has the effect of making that exclusion an essential part of who we are. 
And if you look at all of today's news, that exclusion seems to be more important than anything else, which brings me back to Mary Torrance Lathrop, a poet who tried to tell us that we should immerse ourselves in other, color, uh, in other cultures. That's what the poem says. Not to appropriate those cultures, but to try and understand that if we had grown up in that culture under those conditions, we would be like the person we see. So what defines a person? Is it their average behavior or their outliers? Is it their standards or the standards of their era? Or is it the habits of their great grandparents? Who defines a person? Is it their own context that should define them or that of their friends or of their enemies? Or do we get to define them by ours, years and miles away? Who judges a person? It's a tough question. And I sincerely hope you think it is. <laughs> because as I said before, when answers are simplified, they're wrong. We just have an unspoken agreement not to say that they're wrong. And this is true of all answers and it's true, as true of people as it is of geometric shapes. When you see someone who can't finish lifting the glass up to their mouth, you may judge that according to your experiences or you may judge it according to shared knowledge you get from others, whether it's true or false, or you may have a different unspoken agreement like the emperor's new tailor. Personally, I've been in a situation where I couldn't lift a glass up and had to use my other hand to do it. I used to train with weights pretty heavily when I was young. And I, I've trained to the point where my biceps cannot complete that move. I don't have the strength in the entire bicep to do a full curl. So I've had to bring my other hand up to do it. I don't know if the rest of you have had that, but uh, to me, that was a very clear demonstration of a lack of strength across the entire course of the muscle. Um, but as we discussed before, you need to fail to learn. And anyone who brags that they have never failed is really telling us that they've never learned. Never learned that they're not great with numbers, never learned that they're not a genius, never learned that they may not even be very stable. What are we failing to learn? Me, you, all of us. What are we failing to learn about the world, about ourselves, and about others? Was Mary Torres Lap Lap Torrens Lapthrop an ally? cultural appropriator, a white savior? Was she self-serving or charitable or was she something else? I'd like to believe she was as sincere as I am. I'd like to believe that because I'm trying to be sincere and open and I just don't know if I'm succeeding or if I'm just being self-serving. I'd like to believe that, but that doesn't mean much unless you individually decide that it should and choose to use my opinions to inform yours. If you do, will it be because of the time I've spent here talking to you or the number of words I've used or is it the effect of the number of qualifications I hold or did I show you some secret sign that says that we're in the same group? Was it just an influence of your own cross-generational habits? Old white man is speaking, he must provide wisdom. Maybe it's because you actually came to a rational decision. If you'd like to think about that, to try to consciously and conscientiously decipher your own decisions by trying to decipher and understand your perception of others, then I really encourage you to do so. And if I can help you in any way, please let me know. Thank you very much. I'm leaving the uh, poem uh, by Mary Torrance Lathrop here. Again, uh, I have showed you the first verse before. This is the last four verses, the bit that I think shows that she was really speaking well about our failures in being prejudiced and the richness and depth of the things we have to try to understand to overcome that. Thank you.